Good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbore University, which is funded by a grant through the U.S. Forest Service. This is Robin Osborne from Michigan State University. My EAB University colleagues are Professor Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University Extension. Today's webinar is entitled New Tools for Detecting Exotic Native Forest Pests and is presented by Sarah Wegmuller from the University of Con Wisconsin in Madison. Sarah is a graduate student pursuing her PhD in forest ecology, and her work focuses on developing software that uses remotely sensed data to help forest managers and forest health professionals. Her work is funded by the Forest Service and is being made freely available upon completion. Further, she is the founder and owner of a small business called Silvacart that processes a data processing service, provides a pro data processing service aimed at helping different agencies with remote sensing projects. She has worked with several state and federal forestry entities in the aftermath of severe storms and fires to provide maps for the damage quickly. To our participants today, we welcome your questions and comments. Please type them in the Q&A feature or the chat pod, and we will respond to them after the webinar presentation. Tomorrow, you will be mailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us keep these free educational webinars coming to you. The email will also include Sarah's contact information if you have questions and comments after the webinar is over. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emerald-bore.info website. Thank you for attending everyone today. And Sarah, please unmute your mic and you can begin your presentation. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm happy to be here, um, as uh, Robin kind of alluded to. Uh, this talk is going to provide a brief overview of satellites and airborne sensors commonly used to monitor forest health in the United States. Um, we'll discuss the factors that are important in mapping different types of forest disturbances and the tools best suited for each. Um, I will be focusing more on open source and or freely available information, resources, and tools, um, but some proprietary stuff will also be included. To organize this talk, I'm going to break it up into three major segments. Um, in the first segment, I'm going to talk about where most of the remotely sensed data used in this context comes from. Um, in the second segment, I'll explain some of the tools and systems that are out there, who owns them, and who has access to them. Um, in the final segment, I will be offering some insight on what tools and systems are going to be most appropriate for different types of forest disturbances. But before we begin, a word of warning. Usually I like to keep my presentations pretty clean, um, but in this case, I have a feeling that uh, many of you may be interested in the slides after this presentation. Um, I want these slides to be able to stand on their own when I'm not there to talk about them. So I've left a lot more details on the slides than I normally would. Um, so if you've got a pen and a pad of paper in front of you and you're ready to take notes, I would say the most important one that you wanna jot down is my email. Um, so I can send you a copy of these slides later. Um, then you can focus more on what I'm saying instead of trying to capture what's on the screen because there's gonna be a lot. Um, it also helps you focus a little bit more on any questions that may come up as we go along, um, so we can answer those after the presentation. The other thing I need you all to be aware of is, is that this presentation is not going to cover absolutely everything out there. Um, I'm just going to highlight some things that I think are the most important and accessible right now. Okay, so let's get into segment one, which is the data. The first thing we need to talk about is a thing called spatial resolution. And this roughly translates into what you can see in an image depending on the size of the pixels. Um, and the yellow box are examples of what we call high spatial resolution. So for example, in NAPE imagery, which is that picture on the far left, um, each pixel represents an area on the ground of about two feet. At this resolution, you can see individual trees. And what we're looking at here are some oak trees that died of oak wilt. Um, now the next picture over, um, the pixel size is about three meters or 10 feet. At this resolution, you can still sort of see the trees, but it's starting to get blurry. Um, and right in that, you know, roughly two to five meter range, 
that's where a lot of your commercial satellites are. And we're going to talk about those later. Um, and the orange box is what we call moderate resolution. Um, you pretty much lose individual trees at this point. Um, and any analysis done on this type of imagery is really looking at the whole stand or large pieces of the forest. Moderate resolution imagery is good for things like severe disturbances, tornadoes, fire. Um, and this is also where a lot of your government freely provided imagery comes from. But if you really want to capture what's happening in individual trees, uh, you, you kind of need that high spatial resolution, that stuff in the yellow box. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of that is commercial imagery, uh, much of which you will, you will have to pay for. Um, there is one more category that we call coarse spatial resolution. And this is the main, I'm sorry, the main sensor you'll see in this category is MODIS. Um, and each pixel in MODIS imagery represents 250 to 500 meters on the ground. Um, so this is, this is these, are, these are huge pixels. Um, so this, you know, it allows MODIS to cover a heck of a lot of area, um, but it's really a landscape regional level sensor. So it'll give you an idea, for example, of where a severe disturbance is, severe and large. Um, but the level of detail is pretty limited. Um, so we're going to talk about um, more about all these here throughout this presentation. So let's take a second and talk about satellites versus airborne imagery. Um, the first thing you need to know about satellites, at least the ones used in this context, is that they tend to fall into two broad categories that I've kind of already alluded to, um, government owned and operated and commercially owned and operated. Your government satellites often offer the freely available imagery, which is a really great thing. Um, the trade-off is that these images usually have, again, that moderate spatial resolution, meaning they're gonna go, they're better suited for landscape, you know, whole forest level analysis. You're not gonna be able to see individual trees. Um, to get down to a spatial resolution more appropriate to see individual trees, you're looking at commercial satellites. Um, and these can be, they can vary a lot in terms of cost. Um, sometimes it's worse to pay that cost for commercial imagery, and sometimes it's better to get airborne imagery. Um, it can depend a lot on what your project goals are. The other important thing uh, when talking about satellites is that they can't take an image of the ground if it's a cloudy day. Um, satellites are up there orbiting the Earth, and they don't necessarily go over the same spot every day. This is what's called a revisit rate. So for something like a satellite like Sentinel-2, which is a moderate resolution run by um, Europe, you can get a satellite overhead about every five days. But if it's cloudy that day, you're waiting another five days at least. Um, on the other hand, there's airborne imagery. Um, and if you need some really good imagery with a lot of detail, your best bet is to get airborne imagery. Usually the companies who do this will be able to fly when you need them to and get the level of detail that you want. Um, the trade-off is that this can be very expensive depending on how much area needs to be imaged. There's also a lot of correction that needs to be done on the imagery to account for the motion of the aircraft. And trust me, when I say it is absolutely worth it to get a contractor that will do this correction for you before they deliver the imagery. Okay, so let's talk about where you get some of this imagery. Um, I'm going to start with the USGS's Earth Explorer website, and this is a really great repository of all kinds of imagery, including both airborne uh, NAEP imagery and satellite Landsat data. Um, you do need an account for this website, but it's free, and all the imagery is free, and they do have this incredible archive that you can pull from. Another great resource is Copernicus, which hosts Sentinel data. Uh, which is provided by the European version of NASA. Um, you also need an account for this website, but again, it's free, and so is all of the imagery. Now, there are also a number of websites that offer access to commercial imagery, um, but you'll be paying for most of these. Um, still, it's sometimes cheaper to get commercial imagery than airborne. Um, again, it depends on what spatial res resolution you need or how much detail you need to be able to see in an image. The one exception I list here is the CIDR program. And this is a federal program that works with commercial satellite companies to provide imagery for certain projects um, free of cost. 
Um, this has to go through the Forest Service though. Um, so if you are, you know, state or private, I think you can still do it, but there is a bit of red tape involved to get there. Um, still, it might be worth considering, especially if you work on public land. To get airborne data, uh, there are a few companies out there that do this, and some of you may even have your own in-house capabilities. I'm highlighting one company here called Certex, but they aren't the only ones. These folks are actually one of the contractors that collect NAEP imagery every year, uh, which is imagery with a very high spatial resolution, usually less than a meter. Um, and it's provided to the public for free because the government very kindly pays the bill for that stuff. So this is a great resource. But CERDEX will also accept other projects and can produce some really, really pretty imagery. Uh, but they do have costs involved with things like fuel, pilots, plane maintenance, et cetera. Um, these are not unreasonable costs, and they are usually very willing to work with you within your timeline and you know, needs of the project. Uh, but still, if you go this route, uh, this is something that most agencies will need to budget for. OK, I'm going to take a quick minute to talk about LIDAR, because I'm sure sure many of you have heard about it, but some of you may still be a bit fuzzy on what it is. LiDAR, in short, is a way of making a 3D model of the ground. Um, lasers are emitted from a plane, and there's a sensor that records the data on the height of the objects that those lasers hit. Um, I'm not going to go into more detail than that, uh, but there's a lot of info, some nice fancy videos online explaining exactly how this works if you're curious. Instead, I want to focus on, on what types of projects that LiDAR data um, can be, that you can derive from LiDAR data. And there are three main ones that you'll often see. The first is called a digital surface model. And this will basically look a lot like, mm, <laughs> like a little Lego version of the landscape. You'll see trees, houses, all that good stuff. Uh, the second product is called a digital terrain model. And this is what's left on that big Lego foundational sheet after all the Legos have been cleared off, um, except you'll see <laughs> things like elevation of hills, valleys, and cliffs. Um, this is just a representation of topography, no trees, no buildings, any of that. Um, the final product is what is called a canopy height model. And this is useful for understanding the height of stands in a forest and even individual trees. There is an effort out there to use LiDAR data for forest inventory, um, but nothing that I know of right now is good enough that I would recommend it. Um, but this is a technology that is making leaps and bounds right now. So LiDAR data used to be pretty scarce and expensive, um, but in the last few years, the USGS has really made an effort to collect a lot of data and provide it freely available to the public. Um, now we've got it over much of the US and they're collecting more all the time. Um, you can find that data on the USGS site listed here. Um, and again, remember, happy to provide you a copy of these slides after the presentation so you don't have to jot that down real quick. Okay, so let's move on to the second segment, which is the tools that are available to work with this data. And I'm gonna start actually with some general software that is out there. Um, I imagine most of you have heard of ArcGIS, and this is the most commonly used software to display imagery and do some basic analysis on it. Um, it also has some tools built in for LiDAR, um, but um, <laughs> frankly, there's still some room for improvement with those tools, but they do exist. Uh, the biggest drawback to ArcGIS, and some of you guys might know it as ArcMap, um, is the cost of the license. Um, but a lot of agencies have been willing to pay this bill because it is one of the more, more common you know, useful tools out there. Another common software is Envy, which is really ta tailored more towards image analysis specifically and has some nice features in it. Um, but like ArcMap and Envy, um, sorry, like ArcMap, Envy also comes with a hefty license cost. On the free side, there are also a number of options available. Uh, probably the most common and intuitive is QGIS or QGIS. And QGIS looks a lot like ArcGIS, but it doesn't have as many features to tie databases together. So for somebody like me, um, this works great. And in fact, I use QGIS quite a bit. Um, but if you need to tap into something like an organizational share drive, um, ArcGIS does win in that regard. 
Another nice freely available software is Cloud Compare. And this is designed to work with LiDAR data. Um, I use this a lot personally for visualization, uh, but I find it has some limitations when doing analysis, but it is out there. Um, at the more difficult end of the freely available options are the programming languages such as R, Python, and C++. Now, if you know what you're doing, um, these can be incredibly powerful tools. And this is actually my bread and butter. Um, but that learning curve to use this stuff can look like, <laughs> kind of like the half dome out in Yosemite. Like this is, these are steep cliffs to climb. Um, but if you're willing to make that climb, uh, the rewards are very worthwhile. And then finally, I have Google Earth Engine listed here. Um, and this is another really powerful tool with a bit of learning curve but it's really become an important in this field. Um, Google Earth Engine is different in that it is a cloud-based system and comes with just so, so much imagery already ready to go. Like all the free archive um, that is in Google Earth Engine, I'm sorry, um, Earth Explorer, that USGS site I mentioned a few slides back. So users log into Google Earth Engine via a website and you can run analysis on incredible amounts of data using offsite storage um, and computational power. So in a nutshell, it allows you to do a heck of a lot more on an ordinary workstation than you would otherwise be able to do. Uh, but as with everything else, there are, are trade-offs. Um, namely, you have to know how to write a little bit of JavaScript programming um, to use the tools here. Uh, there's also a limit on what you can actually save at a Google Earth Engine. So if you create these really great maps, but they're beyond a certain size, um, you're gonna have a hard time downloading them to your local computer. Uh, I find this to be a major limitation personally, and this is the main reason I don't use this resource as much. Now we'll move on to some websites, software, and other programs that have been specifically created to map disturbances in forest. Um, and I'm gonna spend more time here on some uh, rather than others, um, just cause some have more information available than others. Um, and I'm gonna include details for each, more details for each than I'm really gonna talk about. Um, and again, because you're welcome to have a copy of these slides. Um, I'm gonna start here with a couple really long range options. Um, both of these tools are better suited to informing long range goals or observing long range trends. Um, the first is LandTrender, which was developed out in Oregon State University. And this program is based in Google Earth Engine and is intended to highlight trends over several years. Um, it uses Landsat imagery, so this is best suited for kind of a landscape level observations. Um, I've seen people use this for observing trends and especially like recovery after a wildfire or major windstorm. On the other system on this page is Global Forest Change, um, and it has its own website. And this one was developed at the University of Maryland and is an attendant to observe changes on a global scale. And this is a screenshot of what that website looks like. And uh, I gotta say, this is actually a pretty fun website to poke around in. Um, there's some really cool stuff that you can see on this website. Um, but if I'm being honest, it will have limited practical use for probably most of you in this audience, just because the scale is just so huge. So I'm gonna move on, but this is a fun website. Okay, the next system I'm going to talk about is one that many of you may already be familiar with, and that is Forewarn. So Forewarn was developed by the Forest Service, and it's the only system that I'm going to talk about today that uses MODIS data. Um, and as you may remember, MODIS is that very coarse resolution data, that 250 to 500 meter pixels, um, meaning that the system is going to cover a lot of ground, but it isn't going to have the most detailed information. However, one really nice thing about MODIS is that it collects imagery every day. Um, so what Forewarn lacks in detail, it makes up for in timeliness. So this system can be really useful for finding the general area of severe and large damage after major events like tornadoes, derechos, or hurricanes. Um, this is a picture of Forewarn's website. And the color Colors indicate how much relative change was observed from the normal imagery as compared to um, the rest of the imagery archive that it's looking at. Um, so what has changed versus the normal? Um, and this is after Hurricane Ian, this recent hurricane down in Florida. The challenge with Forewarn though, is that I'm told the maps are 
because of that course resolution, they're good for general area, but they're pretty tough to use for salvage or management purposes. Um, for that, I, uh, the foresters I've worked at found that higher spatial resolution is needed. Which brings us to the systems designed for these severe disturbances, but which use moderate resolution imagery, usually Landsat or Sentinel-2. That's your 10 to 30 meter range pixel size. Um, these systems actually have only been around for a couple of years. And part of that is because Sentinel-2 was only launched in 2016. So there's a bit of the science learning what is possible with that data. Um, all of these systems, with the exception of ORS, uh, were developed roughly about the same time. So their purposes are going to look similar um, as, as their methodology. So <laughs> in a sense, if you're, if you're a nerd like me, you can consider this is kind of a software example of convergent evolution. Um, sorry, bad joke. All right, the first system I'm going to talk about is Hiveform, which was developed by the same folks that created for Warren. The difference is that, again, this system uses moderate resolution imagery, so the details are a lot better. Um, the system uses two images, one before an event and one after event, and then it looks at the changes within that time frame and quantifies that change. And this is an example um, that is posted on their website. And this shows hail damage in Alabama. And the legend on the left gives you some indication of what those colors mean. Highform is based in Google Earth Engine. So this, you know, this may require a bit of a learning curve um, to use if you're not familiar with that system. Um, sorry, with Google Earth Engine. But as far as I can tell, it is still free to use and may be worth the effort to learn how to use it. Unfortunately, I can't tell you a lot more about Hiveform than this um, because I personally have not used it. The next system I'm going to talk about is Astropy. Uh, and this one I can tell you absolutely everything about <laughs> because I developed it. Uh, like Hiveform, Astropy also looks at two images and quantifies the difference. Um, but in this case, it uses machine learning, whereas Hiveform uses, I believe, subtraction. Another major difference is that Astropy is the only one on this list that has been proven to work with high spatial resolution imagery, um, which is that imagery between the three and five meter range. And I did this specifically with planets dove imagery because that the planet doves are actually a group of satellites that are up there um, collecting imagery every single day. Um, so what that means is that often astropy can provide a map much more quickly and with more detail than if it was restricted to only using Sentinel-2 or Landsat. The other thing unique about astropy on this list is that I never intended it to be run by local forest managers or forest health professionals. Um, I guess I'm in the camp that believes that those folks, maybe many of you, already have quite enough to worry about without having to learn yet another new system. Um, so while this droppy is technically freely available, the goal was that either myself or the folks in the Forest Service who fund me would run this for people and just simply give them the resulting map without having to learn about satellites and where to get the imagery, et cetera. And these are just some of the examples of what Astropy has mapped. Um, and it can handle not only severe abiotic events, you know, wind throw and such, um, wildfire, but it also done a pretty good job with you know, big defoliation events like spongy moth. Um, that's actually out in Pennsylvania. So it's a fairly capable system. Okay, onto ORS and Delta Viewer. Both of these systems were also developed by the Forest Service, but in a different group than those that created high form and forewarn. And this group is called GTAC. Um, and GTAC is a very, uh, they're very focused on national forest lands. Um, they're not as geared towards the state and private side. So I wish I had more to tell you about these two systems, but there actually isn't a lot of public information out there on them. Um, I know ORES uses a time series, which is pretty cool and unique on this list. Usually you can get some really good data from a time series. And Delta Viewer is another two date change detection system, similar to Highform and Astropy. Uh, but beyond that, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to refer you to GTAC to learn more about those two systems. Okay, let's talk about a system called Ravage, um, which was developed specifically for wildfire. Um, this is another GTAC system and is actually part of a group of products that is produced to support those dealing with wildfires. 
Um, there are a couple of important things worth noting about Ravage. Um, first and foremost, it is specifically calibrated for Western fires. Um, it has been used in other areas in the US. Um, I know specifically it was used in Minnesota a couple of years ago, but you're rolling the dice a little bit because again, the system was really designed for Western fires. Um, the other thing worth noting is that if you're outside the forest service, you may get charged for these maps. I don't know how much, um, but it may be worth asking if this is something that could be useful to you. Here's an example of a Ravage map produced for a fire in Arizona. Um, a lot of time these products, once they're complete, are made publicly available. Um, you can just go download these. Um, I pulled this one off their site just the other day from my personal computer so I could have an example to show you. And so these are pretty good products. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit and look at systems tailored specifically to monitor for mortality due to forest insects and diseases. Um, these will catch mortality from abiotic stuff too, like drought and high water, um, but the spatial resolution is really intended for single tree analysis. And these are brand new systems. Um, both have only been developed like this year. Um, they're also both quite closely related. Um, I'm gonna start with Tree Crown Health or TCH. So TCH was developed um, primarily by another forest service group called FAHAST. Um, and FAHAST is actually part of the state and private arm of the forest service. So their work is generally a bit more accessible to those outside of the forest service. Uh, TCH leverages airborne imagery called NAEP. Um, and again, this is that freely available airborne imagery with really good spatial resolution of less than a meter. Um, this software, what it does is it takes that image from the nape um, and it categorizes each pixel as either healthy, morbid, and they kind of look reddish or dead, which you know a dead tree generally looks gray in imagery. It'll also find shadows because when you're dealing with imagery um, on this resolution, you really can see shadows and you don't want those kind of obscuring the analysis for the you know, non-shaded stuff. So like Astropy, uh, the creators of TCH just want to provide a map to folks. Um, and as far as I'm aware, these maps can be requested one way or another um, from FAHAS directly. And here's an example of the output generated by TCH. Um, and what you're looking at here is a patch of forest that is suffering some pretty bad oak weld infestation. Uh, the challenge that they've had with this system, um, particularly in patchy forests where you've got gaps in the canopy that show the ground, is that it's classifying those bits of bare ground. Um, and this can be a problem because uh, bare ground, especially dirt, can sometimes be labeled as dead trees when in fact they're not trees at all. So you get what's called some false positives in there that are you know, not actually something you're concerned about. Which brings us to TreeCap, um, which is another system that I developed specifically um, with the help of FAHAST. Um, I'm actually working on the publication for the system right now. Um, so while it's not technically available just yet, um, I'm talking about it today because it's coming very soon, probably by the end of this year or early next year. Um, TreeCap uses the same data that was used to create the TCH system, uh, but in TreeCap, I pulled in LiDAR data to help um, clean up those patches of bare ground that were causing such heartache for the TCH system. Um, TreeCap also has a different model to do the predicting of the tree health condition. Um, it uses a machine learning model. And that makes uh, TreeCap a little bit more flexible and easier to use. Um, it's also pretty accurate, although TCH is also good. The other major difference with TreeCap is that by using that at LiDAR data, there is a built-in way to compare years. And I did that so that in areas with abnormal levels of mortality, um, those areas would stick out like a sore thumb when you looked at the difference between the maps. So my goal in developing the system was to provide means for forest managers and forest health professionals to recognize when something was very wrong um, and hopefully give them an opportunity to manage those pockets air, you know, those pockets sooner rather than later. And just like a stroppy, I designed tree caps such that the maps could be just given to the user. Um, there's no need for most folks to learn how to use a new system on this one either. And here's an example of tree caps output. Um, this is in California, and this is an area that really got hit hard with drought and pine beetle damage. Um, but it really shows how easily mortality can see when you map it 
fairly simplistically using these systems. And in the case, it's, uh, it's those yellows and pink colors that are indicating dead trees and ones that are recently dead. And then here's another map from TreeCap, but this is an example of that change detection capability. Um, most of that yellow, which indicates newly dead trees, is due to emerald ash borer. This is in Wisconsin. Um, and this is what I mean by highlighting areas with a lot of mortality. Most forests don't have trees that die on this level within just a couple years, unless it's something abnormal. Uh, and in this case, of course, it's, it's EAB, an invasive insect. All right, so for this final segment, I'm gonna to try to offer up some insight on which of these tools I just rattled off <laughs> may be good for different situations. Uh, but first I wanna again, consolidate uh, what tools are available and how to get help. Um, so some like Forewarn, um, it's as simple as going to their webpage. Others like Highform and Lanterner use Google Earth Engine. And finally, there are ones like Ravage, Stroppy, TCH and TreeCrap where all you have to do generally is ask for the map. Um, I also want to provide a quick note um, on this entity you've been seeing called Silvercart, which Robin also gracefully introduced for me. Um, Silvercart is basically my attempt to provide a sustainable solution for forest managers and health professionals, especially those outside of the forest service to get help when they need it with this stuff. So Silvercart is basically a small business that handles the data processing needed to run these freely available systems like a Stroppy and TreeCap. So, you know, finding that satellite and downloading and just sending it through the processing pipeline. It's more or less a remote sensing scientist for hire when you need one without having to pay somebody on staff full time. Um, I really would have started Silvercard as a nonprofit if I could have, uh, but that requires a lot more paperwork, um, especially tax paperwork. Um, so right now, keeping it as an LLC is just easy and sustainable, although I'd like to eventually move it into that nonprofit range in the future. But moving on, let's go into some situations. Uh, let's say a tornado rips through your forest and you'd like to know where the damage is and how bad it is. Um, a few things you need to consider is how quickly you need a map. Is this for salvage or are you tasked with clearing roads? If you need to clear roads where people are trapped, as in this is quite a dire situation, um, you're still going to be better off getting somebody up in a plane to look out windows and mark down blocked roads. It's going to be pretty difficult to get satellite imagery turned around in less than a day unless their satellites already tasked to do that and the clouds have moved on. Um, so I believe for sometimes like hurricanes, they will task those satellites, um, but hurricane clouds take a while to get out of the way. So sometimes that's not helpful. Um, but if you're aiming at salvage and recovery, well, now you've got some satellite-based options. Um, Forewarn, again, will give you the general idea and the general area, and a stroppy and high form can help you get that damage map relatively quickly. So what about things like spongy moth and spruce budworm? Um, this usually depends on how severe that defoliation is. Um, if it's a good, good chunk of the canopy missing, a stroppy and high form should be able to pick that up. Um, if it's relatively minor, these systems might struggle, um, but that has a lot to do with the spatial resolution these systems use. If a stroppy is used in dove imagery, it should pick up more, um, but there's, you know, the trade-off is that there's a cost associated with that dove imagery. Dove imagery is a commercial satellite. What if you have wildfire in your area? Well, if this is forest service land, I personally would point you to Ravage. I think Ravage is worth trying. It's a nice free option built for the forest service. Um, again, some public lands can use that, but I don't know what their rules are. Um, otherwise, a stroppy and high form are also good options in this case. What if you're just concerned about just keeping an eye on things? So you've got a vast area of forest and you just, you wanna make sure you're not losing trees that you're not aware of. Um, to my knowledge, the best systems for this are the recently developed TCH and TreeCap. This is, this is actually why they were developed, because as far as we knew, nothing like that existed and we saw a need for it. Um, and these, again, are brand new systems. Um, they can still be used now, um, but FAHAS is actually working to get these maps produced on a large scale, uh, maybe as early as next year. This is very um, new, something we're still discussing, but that's where we would like to go. And the real benefit of uh, FAHAS doing this work is that they have access to that NAEP imagery, you know, earlier than the general public. And I'm hoping that means they can produce the output and share it widely, 
even before the imagery becomes available. And again, FAHAS is at state and private, so they are able to um, reach out quite a bit um, to entities even beyond the Forest Service. So this is an area definitely worth paying attention to because I think there are gonna be some really great tools coming out of here um, very soon. Okay, what if you got some other issue that just isn't listed here? Um, you got maybe a special case. Um, I would encourage you then to reach out to the folks listed on this slide and ask for advice, depending on if you are a federal entity or you're state and private. Um, I think the biggest challenge that those of us in this field have is trying to explain what is actually realistic with the resources that are out there right now. Hopefully I've given you a good idea in this presentation, um, but <laughs> I definitely have you know, come across folks who think that we can do a lot more with satellite imagery than we actually can right now. Right now. Um, so, you know, for example, the Department of Defense can seem to just move mountains, um, but that is because they have a much larger budget and a lot more resources, and many of those resources are classified, so it's not like we can use them. Um, so the big difference between what you see on the news and what is, you know, there's, there's a big difference between what is practical in a lot of forestry applications. And with that, I want to thank you all for your time. I hope this was useful. Um, and please, if you have any questions, um, please let me know. Thank you, Sarah. Um, if we have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat pod or the Q&A pod, whichever one you feel most comfortable using um, at this point. And I'm going to keep this open for a couple more minutes to see if there's anything um, that you want to speak with, with to Sarah at this moment. Um, but in a couple minutes, if there is uh, people are just kind of mulling over what they want to talk to her about, just remember um, there is an email coming to you tomorrow and you with her information on it and a survey so that you will be able to contact her some other time if you have questions about this. It's a lot of information that we've got today. This is great. Yeah. Um, uh, we do have a question here. Does THC or tree cap use NIR, NAIP, or NDVI? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> educated question. That one is. Um, so TCH uses, oh gosh, um, it, it actually uses the three bands. It does not use the near band. It uses the blue, red, and green bands, and they use hue, saturation, and value. So it's kind of an, a unique thing um, in the remote sensing world to use. Um, TreeCap does use that near band. It uses the near band in addition to a bunch of vegetation indices, and all that is fed into uh, the machine learning model. So I guess in short, TCH does not use near. Um, TreeCap does. Okay. I would really like to know if nobody has questions. I just like, can people post in the chat if this was useful or if I've lost you? Because <laughs> I really sure. didn't want to lose you, but I'm afraid of that. If there's anything I can clarify in the presentation. Yeah, if you want to respond in the chat, folks, um, that'd be great. Um, let's see, we got, oh, uh, uh, Jeremy Nestor wants to know, are there ISA CEUs available? I'm sorry, I guess not for this one, there aren't right at this moment, um, um, but uh, the one that uh, Cliff Sadoff is doing um, in a couple of weeks, we will have that um, since this is um, something that is just uh, kind of going over some new information. So no, at this point, we do not have CEUs for ISA. All right, anybody else? Okay, we are getting people here. Um, uh, we have one, uh, Tom says can't type in chat, but we'll say this was very helpful and interesting. Um, great. Rick <laughs> Turcott says that. great talk, learned a ton, thank you. And Good. Jen Weimer says great presentation, thank you. Jane Rombeth says very useful. I like, I like the high level overview of tools and resources to learn more. Oh, I think you're. I think you're hitting hitting the nail on the head here, <laughs> Sarah. Good. Okay, let's see here. Um, here's a very general question from Stephen. I have a um, when I use general outline things like Google Satellite, I get imagery in full foliage. 
What can I use to get winter info emphasizing softwoods? Right, that's a good question. So if you're if you're just going on like Google Earth, like just Google Maps and kind of looking at the satellite, um, I would actually encourage you to download uh, Google Earth. Um, I think they call it Google Earth Pro now. It's free. Um, it's it's like a pretty easy thing to use. But the nice thing about Google Earth Pro is you still get that satellite imagery, but it's got this this tool on it for time, and you can go back in time. And every place that I've looked at. At, um, when I use that tool, I usually can find at least one image that is during the winter time. Um, now, what year that would be is a bit of a toss up. Um, so <laughs> it depends on if there's a time frame you're looking at, but if you're just in general, like where are my conifer stands, um, Google Earth Pro should be able to help you out with that. Um, hopefully that is useful. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm not seeing. Oh, Stephen says thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, I'm not seeing any more at this point. But then I was going to. That was too soon. Um, John says it's a very helpful presentation. This question is a bit tan. Gentle, but I but many of these maps are challenging to interpret if one has poor color vision. Are there workarounds for that? Oh yes, John. I <laughs> I don't have a, I don't have trou troubles with my color vision, but I when I design my maps, I do try to account for that. So I was hoping that at least tree caps would be something you could see with those challenges, but maybe I maybe I missed the mark on that one. Um, usually, when you get these maps. Um, you should be able to request them in a way that you can set your own color scheme. Um, I know TreeCap specifically um, comes with that option um, depending on how you display it. So really that should not be a limitation whatsoever in requesting these tools. I would just say that if you request a map, um, at least from those resources where maps can be requested, I would make a note say, hey, please put this in a, you know, uh, a, a color scheme that is friendly to those with uh, color vision problems or color vision challenges. Um, as far as the online tools, that I can't, I don't have any, I don't have any insight on that one because those are run by entities that I think automate that. Um, there's definitely a, a group of folks out there and I'm, I'm in this, this camp too that, you know, I see this, what we call the stoplight color scheme. And we're like, you know, this isn't really the best scheme for everybody. There's a lot of people that, uh, are not going to be able to see the usefulness in this. Um, I hope that changes. I don't know that it will. <laughs> All right, John says, thank you for your response. You're welcome, John. If you ever request any maps from me, I'll make sure that they are friendly for you. <laughs> you know, it sounds like as much as much work as you have done with this, and we have gotten many questions on Emerald Dashboard, uh, my inner, in, Emerald Dashboard.info website page, people ask about more and more about how can we find these, you know, critters through technology easier. And so this is this is a great introduction because it sounds like every everyone's kind of working on it. And I'm sure in a couple of years, we'll think, oh, yeah, I remember back when, when it was more difficult. So it sounds like yeah. this work is really, really progressing well on this. There, there's some great up and coming technologies um, that I like in the next five to 10 years, I think there's going to be some really incredible stuff out there. And the stuff that I present today is going to look stone age stuff, but um, just like everything else, it's just making leaps and bounds right now. So, well, I thank you so much for presenting this for us because that this has been um, one of the first webinars we've been able to actually put on with detailed information about what is going on. So this this has been very helpful. And um, I will be, again, folks, um, I will be putting this on the Emerald Ashbor um, University webpage on the um, eab.info site, as well as our Emerald Ashbor University YouTube channel. So if you need to watch it again, or you want to refer it to someone, um, those are two places that you could do that. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to close off the webinar and um, Sarah, I'll let you get back to your very useful work and, uh, and um, I'll let everyone get back to their day. And thank you so much again, Sarah, for doing your presentation with us today.
Oh yeah, thanks for having me. And I'm glad this was useful for people. All right, take care. Bye.